Hello there and welcome back to this course on bilingualism. In the last video I talked about bilingual reading and in this video we'll graduate to bilingual writing. So when you have a bilingual person sitting down in front of a keyboard and writing a text, what is special about that? In what way is that different from a monolingual person doing the same thing? The ideas that I'll talk about come from chapter 5 of Grosjean and Lee's The Psycholinguistics of Bilingualism. And in that chapter, the idea is explored whether there's anything special about bilinguals engaging in the production of written texts. All right. So, you maybe remember from the last video when I talked about speech production that there are three phases that can be distinguished in speech production, namely conceptualization, where you come up with an idea, something that you want to say, uh, formulation, you turn that idea into words, linguistic structures, and lastly, articulation, where you transform the linguistic structure into a sound that other people can hear and interpret. Now I would like you to do a little exercise and think about how speech and writing are different with regard to these stages. So what is different across speech and writing? What is similar across speech and writing? Take a piece of paper, take a few minutes to reflect on this and after that come back to this video. All right, I'll continue now. What processes are involved in writing? Well, similar to speech production, we can distinguish three uh, broad phases, namely planning, formulation, and revision. So planning involves conceptualization, thinking of something to express. Yeah? So, so in this case, you're thinking of something to write. Um, but there's more to planning than just conceptualization. So you think not only of the idea that you want to express, you also think about the overall structure of the product that you're about to create. So are there ideas that you want to express early on in the text? Are there ideas that should come towards the middle? What do you want to say in the end? These kinds of considerations go into planning. At the same time, you also think about the overall genre of the text. So are you composing uh, a text message to a friend or are you in fact writing a book for a student audience? Well, this will change the way in which you approach your task. Right, so that is planning. Formulation is similar to formulation in speech production. That is, you put thoughts into words, into linguistic structures. And so that means you think about alternative ways to express a certain ideas. So either uh, through different lexical items <clears throat> or also through different morphosyntactic structures. So for instance, if you think about um, yeah, alternations like the active and the passive. Do you want to say the dog bit the mailman or do you want to say the mailman was bitten by the dog? Yeah. Do you want to say John gave Mary the book or John gave the book to Mary? Uh, the grammar of English and the grammar of any other language um, gives you the potential to express the same idea in different ways and this is something that you think about during the formulation stage. Right. Uh, what makes writing and speech production different from one another is this third stage that you see here, the revision stage. So in speech, when you've said something, you've said it. Yeah? What's done is done. There's no going back. Uh, there's no editing. Um, if something came out of your mouth and you don't like it, you have to issue and repair. That is, you have to say something in addition to what you've already said to change the message that you just produced. In writing, you can actually go back and make changes to the text at every level of structural organization. That is, on a micro level, you can choose different lexical elements and you can replace expressions with other expressions. So let's say that in a paragraph you use the same verb twice and you don't like that. Well, you can simply take the second instance, replace it with a synonym and you're done. Yeah? But also at higher levels of uh, textual organization, you can introduce changes. So you can change the structure of a text. Let's say you wrote something uh, in the introduction and later on you decide, well, this rather belongs into the theoretical background section. You can do that. That's not a problem. At the still higher level of topical structure, uh, you can change the entire topic of a text. Let's say midway through an essay that you're writing, you realize that, okay, this argument isn't really going anywhere, so I'll have to change it. 
Well, you can do that, and uh, in the end, you have a text that is substantially different in topic from the one that you started up with. Right, so what's important to realize with regard to planning, formulation, and revision is that these three don't necessarily occur in this linear order. So usually you start out planning a text, and then you go on to formulate some aspects of the ideas that you have planned, and eventually you move on to revising some aspects of the text that you just created. But from there, you can actually go back to planning and formulation. So the organization of these three is more um, circular than linear. Yeah? So you can go back and forth between planning, formulation, and revision. And this, on the one hand, of course, is a good thing, because it means that you are flexible, you can change things, you can um, <clears throat> um, change aspects of the text that you don't like. But at the same time, it introduces a difficulty. Namely, if you have several things going on at the same time, that means that you need some sort of executive control to manage allocation of your attention to these different tasks that are going on at the same time. We'll talk about this in more detail. Right. Um, there are different ways of thinking about writing, and one way of doing so is to think about writing at the level of the finished product. So a good writer needs to know what the finished text should look like, and that means that a good writer needs to have knowledge of genre conventions, so which form and structure is appropriate for a text that I'm producing, what contents are appropriate? Uh, what is the tone that I should use? Can it be a little bit polemical? Can it be funny? Or should it be very detached? Uh, are there words and forms that I maybe should avoid altogether? Yeah. So you're probably aware that there are style guides for academic writing that tell you things like don't use a passive, don't put a preposition at the end of sentences, don't use split infinitives and all that. And from a linguistic uh, point of view, most of that advice is somewhat questionable. Yeah, But at the same time, genre conventions are not logical. <laughs> yeah. So if the genre convention specifies that you know you shouldn't use a split infinitive then well just don't yeah um <clears throat> it's not logical it's just there and so if this is expected of you simply go with it yeah all right um now for the purposes of this class and of this video uh we'll think about writing from a slightly different perspective namely we'll think of writing as a problem solving task so if we have a speaker in front of a keyboard in the situation of having to produce a text, what is going on? How do they figure out how to do it? Yeah. And more specifically, with regard to planning, formulation, and revision, how do writers manage these different tasks uh, that compete for attention? Yeah, so how do speakers decide that, okay, right now I'm going to focus on form, later on I'm going to focus on the overall structure, right now I'm focusing on this idea. Yeah, how does that work? Um, I already said that you need executive control for this purpose. So you need something that we'll call a monitoring function. The writer needs to manage the simultaneous engagement with different tasks, uh, prioritizing one at any given moment and postponing the other ones, um, defocusing the stuff that isn't needed at this very moment. Right, so in summary, um, skilled writers can do a number of things. Uh, they have knowledge of linguistic forms that allow the expression of ideas. They have knowledge of how a text should be put together with regard to structure, with regard to content, with regard to tone. And crucially, they have the ability to coordinate the different tasks that are involved in writing. And they have executive control that lets them focus on any given aspect of that activity. Right. It goes without saying that all of this applies to monolinguals as much as it applies to bilinguals. So how does bilingualism actually come in here? Well, it turns out that bilingual writing comes with its own set of difficulties. And this already starts with uh, text conventions and, and textual genres. So text genres 
may work differently across different languages. And if you know anything about academic writing in French and academic writing in English, you will be familiar with this. So in academic English, it's actually a, a, a valued thing if you are able to express things in very simple terms, you know, use short sentences, basic vocabulary, and uh, adopt a, a down-to-earth tone. In other languages, this may not necessarily be the case. Yeah. <clears throat> Importantly, then also linguistic proficiency plays a role, and especially with regard to the allocation of attention to different aspects of text construction, proficiency is of high importance. So the more limited your L2 proficiency is, uh, the more of a difficulty you will have to juggle higher level processes and lower level processes, because Low-level processes such as lexical retrieval, looking for the right words, and grammatical formulation, where you check, okay, does this um, syntactic structure have all the right things in the right places, are all the um, endings right, and so on and so forth. So that uh, presents a strong competition to the more high-level processes, that is the planning of ideas or the evaluation of actual content. Right. Um, so as a beginning L2 writer, you are more concerned with the practicalities of writing a text and less so with the high-level processes. Um, in previous videos, we already saw that uh, switching between languages incurs a cognitive cost, and as a beginning L2 writer, it's more than likely that you will access your L1 in some form or other during the construction of an L2 text. So also on that front, bilinguals face greater difficulties than monolingual writers. <clears throat> okay, one big aspect of this is fluency. So here we have results from a meta-study of um, <clears throat> articles that have looked at the performance of L1 dominant L2 writers. So when you compare text production across L1 and L2, uh, it's probably not surprising that in the L2 uh, writers produce shorter texts, they use more pauses, and they write fewer words at any given stretch. Yeah? <clears throat> um, what's also difficult, and I hinted at this, is the allocation of attentional resources. So there's empirical evidence to suggest that L2 writers have a greater relative time allocation to sentence construction, so the aspect of formulation is um, taking more effort. Yeah, so formulation takes precedence over planning and revision. And things like lexical retrieval, looking up words in your mental lexicon, that takes cognitive resources away from high-level processes, making it more difficult in total. <clears throat> um, L2 writing is also influenced not only by your knowledge, but also by your attitudes towards what you consider good writing. So what constitutes uh, good writing? Is it a polished style? Is it clarity in expressions? Is it the quality of ideas? Which of these is the most important? Clearly, depending on your upbringing as a writer, you have different ideas regarding these questions. And consequently, your allocation of cognitive resources is influenced by your attitude towards writing and towards these questions. <clears throat> now, one big question that we need to discuss is the role and use of the L1 when you're writing a text in the L2. And there are different strategies that you can adopt as an L2 writer. So one strategy, of course, is to write exclusively in the L2. Uh, this is possible, but this is also difficult, especially when you're just starting out as an L2 writer. When you're L2 proficiency is low, it will take a lot of effort and cognitive energy to write exclusively in the L2. So many L2 writers actually adopt a strategy where the L1 has some role to play. And more often than not, this means that writers generate ideas in the L1 and then do the writing itself in the L2. This means <clears throat> that during the planning stage, the L1 is strongly activated, and during formulation and revision, L2 is more strongly activated. It also means that lots of cognitive resources go to word finding in the L2. 
<clears throat> now, at the opposite end of the spectrum, there are also writers who write a first draft in the L1 and then rather translate that draft in the L2. <clears throat> that means that, uh, well, the planning stage is greatly facilitated with, you know, if you compare that to the, uh, to the first strategy, but then during revision and during formulation, there are many resources that go to the translation of structural patterns from the L1 to the L2. As a generalization, we can state that the higher the L2 proficiency, the smaller the role of the L1. Yeah? So the higher you are in proficiency, in L2 proficiency, the less you make use of the L1. <clears throat> I already mentioned that the use of the L1 can be distributed differently across the three phases of planning, formulation, and revision. For instance, um, you might do most of your formulation in the L2 when most of the planning has been done in the L1, and then revision will involve both to some extent. Um, then the extent of use of the L1 may depend not only on your L2 proficiency, but also on your attitude, so your ideas of how writing ideally should be done. So for instance, let's say that you've been uh, brought up in uh, the, the L1 French and your schooling has happened in French and pretty much all you know about writing and writing conventions is from an L1 French background and suddenly you're being asked to produce texts in English. What are you going to use? Well, um, if you values, if you value the conventions that you've learned highly, then you'll probably try to use what you have and try to transfer that to L2 writing. Yeah? If you don't think much of the conventions that you've been brought up with, then you're probably more willing to switch to new conventions that are directly associated with uh, English writing as such. Now, um, a question that we can ask is, does it help if you're already a good writer in the L1? Up to now, we've talked about the L1 mostly as a kind of obstacle, yeah, something that can get in the way. But uh, it stands to reason that the L1 can actually also be an asset. So does it help if you can already write reasonably well in the L1? Here, um, it would seem that yes, of course, uh, the L1 can be an asset, but at the same time, not all bilinguals use writing to the same extent in all of their languages. So let's think, for example, of the diglossic situation with regard to Swiss German. Swiss German is almost exclusively spoken, whereas um, High German and French uh, are used for writing. So this means that not all bilinguals use writing to the same extent in all of their languages. And <clears throat> this means that it's not always possible to fall back on your L1 uh, as a competence that you have for writing in the L2. <clears throat> um, conversely, we can also ask whether the benefits uh, from good L1 writing skills are somehow inhibited by poor L2 proficiency. So you may be a good writer in your L1, but if your L2 proficiency is very low, it might not even help you to have that kind of competence. Um, the empirical results that we have on this matter is that proficiency actually matters, but in a weird U-shaped kind of uh, development. So that means that proficiency matters during early, your early career of an L2 writer and during your later career of an L2 writer, but not so much in the intermediate stages. Okay, so when you have relatively poor proficiency in the L2, that means that as a writer you have to rely on your L1 writing skills to write in the L2. And um, that means that it helps if you're a good L1 writer in this kind of position. Yeah? Good L1 writers will, as beginning L2 writers, produce better, better results than poor L1 writers. Uh, this changes a little bit when we come to intermediate proficiency in the L2. So that's the stage during which writers try to learn the conventions of the L2. And uh, this is a new skill. Yeah? So this is in some way independent from 
the writing skills that you've already acquired in the L1. So good L1 writers will not necessarily be any better at acquiring these new genre conventions than poor L1 writers. So this has more to do with cognitive flexibility than with something that you've already acquired. <clears throat> and then lastly, uh, once you move into high proficiency in the L2. Um, good L2 expertise means that good L1 writers can easily transfer what it is that they know to the L2 so that good L1 writers will again produce better results than poor L1 writers. Okay, so there is a role of the L1, but it's not linear, it's not strictly predictable, it follows a U-shaped development. Okay, one term that I need to bring up that is discussed in the chapter is the term of multi-competence. So multi-competence refers to the fact that your bilingual knowledge is more than the sum of all skills that you have in each of your languages. There's a surplus value, yeah? So multi-competence means that you know when to apply which knowledge, and this is something that bilinguals are particularly good at. Yeah? So you know when to draw on transfer, when not to draw on transfer, uh, so when you have to stick to a language-specific conventions. And speakers are actually more likely to transfer genre knowledge from one language to another when they consider such transfers to be socially acceptable and desirable. So, so cultural knowledge uh, plays into multi-competence. So, summing up, um, what's special about writing and bilinguals? I presented three interlocking phases, namely planning, formulation, and revision. These are the same for monolingual and bilingual writers, but bilingual writing comes with its own set of difficulties. We looked at writing as a product, uh, but focused on writing as a process, which includes uh, the use of the old one across planning, formulation, and revision. We talked about different strategies that can be uh, employed with regard to the use of the L1. And uh, we talked about different ways of relying on the L1 and how that changes with increasing L2 proficiency. All right, um, in the next video, I'll talk about bilingualism as it is traditionally understood, I wanna say. So we'll talk about bilinguals who are acquiring several languages from early childhood on, that is simultaneous language acquisition. Until then, au revoir and see you then.